ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Eric Rees, entrepreneur and author of The Lean Startup and The Startup Way. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks for coming. All right. Very warm reception. Yeah. Well, you're you're amongst friends here. A lot oh, of uh, a lot of fans that. and acolytes. Yeah, I don't always get that reception. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of places where that. That's not um, so uh, we're here today to talk to Eric Rees, as most of you know, uh, founder uh, of the Lean Startup Movement, and he's got a new book out, uh, Startup Way. Um, I have read it and used up a little bit of my summer break uh, getting through <laughs> this, but uh, but um, Eric's actually kicking off his book tour today, and all of you guys are going to get a pre, pre-release pre copy, um, and he'll be out in the atrium uh, signing books later. So uh, we'll snag him for a couple minutes, and uh, and then he's going to be jetting around the world uh, selling, the, selling the vision. It's nice to start start among friends. That's terrific. That's for sure. Good place to start. I thought maybe we'd start uh, way back uh, in the in the early days of the lean startup, and then you've talked about how, as a as an entrepreneur yourself, you sort of the, the concepts emerge. But I'm curious, uh, you know, when did you think? What was that triggering moment when you said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna start to codify this. I'm gonna start to write it down and and <laughs> like you know make this something." I wish I could say that was some kind of master plan. <laughs> you know, I knew exactly how it was gonna work out because the truth is, it's kind of embarrassing. I was the guy in, in my startups that was always in charge of explaining why we did things weird. It's not actually the most fun job because, you know, we, you're a venture backed startup. You're constantly being subjected to due diligence and scrutiny. You're hiring people who are more experienced than you often. So, you know, you'd be hiring a 10 year veteran of the software industry, or, you know, we'd be sent to the tech due diligence guy of a VC, and I've never been through that process. It's just terrific. <laughs> uh, so, you know, 25-year gray-haired veteran of the software industry, and, and I, was, I was young and, and full of all these crazy ideas, and so it was always my job to explain why we did it that way. And I used to think that it would be sufficient. So a gray-haired person would always be like, listen, kid, this isn't how it's done. You've got to create an engineering requirements document and a product requirements document, and you've got to go through the Watergate process. They have a whole, like, waterfall process, stage gate process, like what I just did there. <laughs> <laughs> On everybody's mind, I guess, right now. <laughs> and so, and, and, and what I now understand, but I didn't because I was too young and stupid, what you're supposed to say in those situations is like, yes, sir, of course, we're going to get right on that. And then the meeting is over because they feel like they checked the box and they move on. Of course, I would say, no, 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 with all due respect, you don't understand. We have a new, better way of doing things. And you know, they'd be like, what, you mean better than what I built my whole career and success on my whole life? <laughs> and of course, I was, I was too dumb to know to say no. And of course, I'd be like, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and they would be like, and, they'd be so, so they, and I used to think that he'd just say, well, listen, why don't you just come and look at the evidence of how well this system works? Which has, in my experience so far, convinced exactly zero people. Because <laughs> for, you forget, you're still talking to a primate, okay? It's still, it's still <laughs> human beings we're talking about. So, you, you know, they're like, I don't want to hear the evidence that this is better. I'm, t- I'm here to tell you the right way. Anyway, so I spent years of fr- total frustration just trying to be like, I need a way of describing and explaining what this works. I could see that it worked, and it intuitively always made sense to me, but it was really difficult to explain to people why. And so, Anyway, so I, so I, you know, I, would, I was a, a voracious reader of management tomes at that time, a lot of garbage business books, and you, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Like, I would read anything I'd get my hands on. Obviously, lean manufacturing like, was a huge breakthrough for me. To, like, finally, here's the intellectual framework that made some sense. You know, obviously, I got a chance to work with Steve Blank and, and you know, study agile uh, software development and eventually meet Kent Beck. And so I had all these influences, and I was trying to like, put, it, put it together. Then when I left that startup, um, I was kind of doing the Silicon Valley thing where you're in between startups, so you're technically unemployed, <laughs> but you try not to look unemployed. You, know, you <laughs> do, do, do things while you figure out. It's a so respectable unemployed. Yeah, it's a very respectable <laughs> unemployed. And all these VCs were calling me up, hey, would you come have coffee with me? And you know, I'm like all these VCs' favorite person all of a sudden. And they would ask me as a favor to uh, come out of retirement slash unemployment <laughs> to meet with one of their portfolio companies to give them some advice about how they could go faster. Because my, my reputation as an engineering leader was that my teams were, were supernaturally productive and speedy in product development for reasons you all now obviously understand. And I kept trying to explain to people it wasn't because I'm an especially good engineering manager, but because I have a better system, which in Silicon Valley, people had exactly zero interest in hearing that. Because <laughs> we believe in the myth of the Superman. So they are like, he's got the magic pixie dust that he can sprinkle on our engineers to make them work harder. 
so I would go to these meetings and I would say, here's how we do things that, you know, we would, we would release software 40 times a day and I explained continuous deployment and people would yell at me. Like it was, a, these meetings did not go well. Okay. These were just not, forget, like you were only talking about like five, six, seven years ago, but like these meetings were not fun. And eventually I would have to be like, time out. You called me <laughs> to come to this meeting as a favor to you to tell you what worked for, so I'm not even, I wasn't even elucidating a theory at that time. I was like, I'm just telling you a story of what worked for me. And people were like, that could never work. I'm like, well, it worked at least one time for me in the story that I'm telling you that you, you asked me to come. In. So, so this is my master plan. This is how, how far, I, I literally started writing the blog because I was like, well, when people ask me for a meeting, I'll send them the blog post. And if they think I'm crazy, then they won't call for the meeting and they'll leave me alone. I was like, that was really as far as I thought about it. And all of a sudden, I mean, these, you know, it, people started going crazy for it and, and, you know, it really took over my life. But it was not, it really was like a self-defense mechanism before it was any kind of like plan. <laughs> yeah. I was so embarrassed. The way you know I was embarrassed about it, my, my name did not appear on this blog. It was called Startup Lessons Learned. It didn't say by anybody. It was like I was like an anonymous person writing about, you know, startup theory. I was too embarrassed that I was blogging. That was considered such a, but not a cool thing to be doing at that time. <laughs> How times have changed. So I pulled a quote out from uh, Startup Way, and uh, I, think it's, I think you opened chapter one with this. It's a quote from uh, Jeff Immelt, former CEO of, of, uh, of GE, yeah. and he says, nobody wants to work at an old-fashioned company. Nobody wants to buy products from an old-fashioned company. Nobody wants to invest in an old-fashioned company. So what, what do you think in the world is going on that these you know, luminaries of industry are, are <laughs> dissing their, their own company and uh, you know, running scared a little bit um, in this? environment well i kind of feel like why isn't it taking them so long to get the memo <laughs> i mean i i can't tell you how obvious it seems to me and to most people who do the actual work in these companies and i feel like and you know with all due respect to jeff Immelt, who i you know obviously admire greatly and who you know, was a wonderful partner with me in, in transforming ge you know but i'm often in the, in the role of having to be like you guys understand that this is not a fad right like the internet's not going anywhere and I, mean, I want some, someone was like, is mobile going to be a thing? It was like two years ago, maybe. I was like, is it going to be a thing? <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what planet are you on? And yet people have, I always have an excuse why. I mean, I was with a, I was doing a, a talk to a bunch of uh, hospital executives. And they were, you know, all about innovation and whatever and whatever and whatever. And I had just uh, had my first child at the time. So I, you know, I just had a very serious hospital experience. You know, I've just been a patient, a customer of this process. Any of you who have given birth know, in a hospital know, like, just, like this is not a customer-centric, <laughs> user-experience-oriented. How much design uh, thinking going Not on. a lot of design thinking. <laughs> and of course, we, we had wonderful, excellent medical care. But I could tell you, I could sit here all day and tell you, like, it just, it, it, you, just you don't want to be a business process person. You got to turn that part of your brain off when you enter in as a patient because you're just like, this is, this is all wrong. <laughs> Everything about this is totally wrong. Like so inefficient. Culminated in a moment where they, they were required to get our, our you know, lunch order, what, what, what my wife wanted to eat each day by like 10 o'clock in the morning because it had to be faxed to the place. And I, and I, I literally was like, I, you know, I was groggy and sleep deprived and I was like, you didn't just say facts, did you? <laughs> and, the, and the nurse, who of course is not empowered to do anything about it, she's like, well, how else could you possibly do it? And I was like, you really asked the wrong person for this question. I was like, are you kidding? And, and luckily, my parents, who, who are doctors, who know better, they're like, you know, <laughs> give me the, like, yeah. you need to be quiet right now. So I, I just, I, you know, I explained to them, I was like, yeah, yeah, but we couldn't do any better. And I was like, anyone here use Uber? This is before, you know, Uber was controversial. <laughs> of course, everyone does. They pull out your phone. Like, do you have that level of user experience for your customers? Why not? And they're like, because we're a hospital. I'm like, that's what someone in a taxi company was said two years ago. But ta-da. And is there something like technologically challenging about the hospital environment that people don't have phones and you can't use? I mean, like, if you really like, you really pierce these objections that like make no sense at all. And so like, of, like why are people are like, why are customers so much more demanding and picky now than they were before? We know the answer because we are them. Look in your phone. You have like the world at your fingers. Like we, we've had a, like, a total revolution of customer expectations. Not to mention the you know, incredible changes in supply chain and all the ability to like, just if you could imagine something, you could have it built, ship, you know, distributed anywhere in the world. You can get information about it anywhere in the world. You can get customers from anywhere. Like who thought we were going to go through all that and then like oh, but our companies would stay the same and our management practice would stay the same and it would be fine. I don't know. I, I, again, it's one of these things where like, I can't believe anyone believes that. 
So it's actually kind of difficult to to be convincing <laughs> when you're in those audiences to say, well, okay, like let's start from first, but we gotta really back up. Like, okay, what is a business? Why are we here? You know, like what like what does it mean to have a customer? How, what do you? How, what is? Who is your customer? I can't tell you how many people in companies today don't they don't know who their customer is. They don't even know what that word means. So like. This is really like, it requires a real ground up. Well, who might say, you guys know. It's real pain in the ass is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> to always have to be making that case, but it's, it's super important. And the companies that don't get it are not long for this world. So, so I, yeah. I want to jump in here. And you know, one thing that came out of the book to me is that I loved when you said like entrepreneur should be a job title that you can have in a, in a big company. So not necessarily coupled to someone who starts a new company, but mm -hmm. could because it's a skill set, not a not a not about the, the, the corporate structure. So yeah. Can you speak to that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Now I call it the missing function uh, in the book that just, you know, it's funny, like you go to a, you walk down the street here to any of our unicorn companies, you know, who are like five years old, but have thousands of employees and ask them to show you their org chart. And you go exhume the body of my good friend, Alfred Sloan, and ask him to show you the org chart from GM from 1929. It looks exactly the same. So, and you just say, like, who on this org chart is responsible for innovation and entrepreneurship? Who, whose job is to make sure that the research and development we do in this company becomes commercialized? Who is trying to protect us from the forces of disruption or harness disruption for new to enter new mic? Who's in charge of that? And I, oh, I ask that question to CEOs all the time. I get the answer either, you know, so-and-so is in charge, you know, the head of IT, the head of marketing, the head of engineering, somebody who has another full-time job already on the side is supposed to also be in charge of this or everybody's in charge, my favorite answer, which really, we all know what everybody's in charge means. That means nobody's in charge. <laughs> so in other words, nobody's, nobody's like waking up in the morning and you're like, if this was marketing that we were talking about or finance, you'd be fired in an instant to be like, we don't need a marketing department. We don't need a VP of marketing. We'll just, everyone's in charge of marketing. <laughs> Can you imagine? Everyone's in charge of finance. <laughs> well, I mean, what the? Who would think that would be okay? Like, it's, it's laughable, but listen, those departments had to be invented, okay? There was a time when there was no marketing department. And in fact, if you read like the early management books from the early 20th century, like Frederick Winslow Taylor and those guys, they didn't have, they didn't forget finance. They would, God, they would have killed to have our accounting understanding. Like they didn't have statistics. They couldn't, they didn't understand marginal profit. They couldn't tell you which of the products they made, made the money and which some law, they, they, we consider those to be the most elementary adders of business literacy, but they all had to be invented. So I kind of just feel like when people 50 years from now, 100 years from now, look at us, they're just going to laugh at us. Like you didn't have anybody in charge of it, so then you weren't good at it. And that was surprising to anybody. Like, <laughs> what, what, do you, what did you expect? So I, yeah, I just think it's like, it's just that basic and that straightforward. Somebody has to be in charge of this. And entrepreneurship is one of the most annoying disciplines there is, because not only do you have to be in charge of managing the company's internal startups, which are a distinct work form. You know, I call this startup as the atomic unit of work uh, from previous generations of like management committees. You all know it, like a 25 person part-time committee. Is that gonna do entrepreneurial things? You, I don't have to tell you anything else about it. You don't have to know who's on it. You know, it could, Steve Jobs himself could be on it. It's not gonna get anything done. Like, this requires dedicated focus. So, so you have to oversee the startup as the atomic unit of work, but you also have to deal with the fact that entrepreneurs are troublemakers, right? Look around, you know, like, look, like, right? So they're constantly like breaking down organizational silos and structures because the whole point is that like we, if we accept that there's gonna be disruption in our product, we have to accept there's also gonna be disruption in the way that we make our product. You can't have, there's no way to have one without the other. It would be ludicrous. So we're gonna be messing around with our organizational form. So the entrepreneurial function has to handle those points of interconnection with the other functions. And then the worst, on top, if that wasn't bad enough, on top of all that, good ideas can come from everywhere. We all pretend that we take that idea seriously and that we are on our companies as a meritocracy, but that's 100% not true. We just don't. If I go to most organizations and I say, I, I say listen, I'm gonna pick someone at random from this org. I'm literally gonna roll, roll a you know, 100,000 sided die and it's gonna pick up, I can pick any employee. I'm gonna sit that employee down and I'll say, okay, let's say today you have the next big idea for your company. How would you get it implemented? What's the procedure? They'd be like, I guess I get my manager to ask his manager, to ask her manager, to ask her three level over peer manager, to ask her manager, to ask this, like, 
just, you know what I'm talking about? Like, you're like, by the time you've described the process, you're like, forget it. <laughs> I'm obviously not going to do that. That's like a huge pain in the ass. Involves all this politics and terror. Like, of course we're not doing that. So like, I'm not going to, like, so then we're like, well, we're not really going to harness any good ideas in this organization because we're not really serious about it. So we have to not only handle the entrepreneurs, but all the would-be entrepreneurs so that when someone has the actual good idea, like everyone knows the famous story of Steve Wozniak begging Hewlett Packard to let him start Apple Computer as part of a Hewlett Packard. Like he and Steve had to, they were like begging for permission to create what is now the world's most valuable company for free for Hewlett Packard because he already worked there and he felt a sense of loyalty and he couldn't find one middle manager in all of HP to even let him run the experiment. And everyone here is like, well, if that happened to me, I wouldn't make that mistake. <laughs> Bullshit, <laughs> right? We come on, we all know it. Nobody wants like everyone's like, well, I'm, I'm looking for the next Steve Jobs. He probably already works for you. But are you actually prepared to do what it takes to make it so that it's a completely routine process for anyone in the company to be able to turn one of their ideas into a minimum viable product, run the experiment, find out if it's any good? Especially given that most people's ideas are terrible. So you can't just be like, well, we're going to do everybody's ideas just because they had an idea, right? We have to have a process for vetting and scientifically evaluating ideas, not through politics and discussion, but through experimentation. So if that's not a dedicated corporate function, I don't know what is. Okay. Um, I got another question for you, and I think our <laughs> clock was misset, so I think we do actually have a little bit more time. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> but actually, Kelly, I think, uh, can we jump to that org chart slide? This is something I just snipped out of the book, and you oh, guys sure. will all see this. Hopefully we have that. Is there another one that's broader? Well, why don't we start with the first one? Yeah, start with sure. the small one. Maybe just talk us through this, the, the sort of separation of concerns here. Yeah, so... I think some people have gotten the memo lately about what they call the ambidextrous organization, the idea that there's a certain amount of experimentation, a certain amount of execution that coexists within an organization. I think that's important to understand. And it's very important to understand that the management practices required to oversee experimentation are distinct from the management practices required for mostly execution type products. I hope everyone here finds that pretty intuitive. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that there's no management in the experimentation side of the portfolio. Like most people, if I interview a person on the street, even here in San Francisco, I say, What's it, what, is, what are the management practices inside of a startup? They'd be like, well, we don't have management. We don't, management's for big companies. And that's, that's like, that's really silly. That's just like we're playing word association with the word management, it sounds boring. We're not boring, therefore we don't do it. But like, <laughs> in, startups are institutions, like we're building a new human institution from scratch. So obviously we're doing management because coordinating the activities of the people is actually the only thing that we do. We have no other work in the early days. We have, no, we have no revenue, no customers, no product. All we do is coordinate activity of people. So of course, they we're doing management. So, so first realization, very important, to recognize experimentation as a management discipline that is co-equal with general management in terms of its rigor, its precision, its, or should be its reputation within the company. So we have to do all that. So I feel like I'm part of a whole movement of people who are trying to push that idea that there are these two things. And yet, that sometimes gives rise to the idea that those are two binary things that can be purely separated, which is also not correct because of portfolio theory, right? Like even the tiniest startup, they do do some execution and even the most stodgy company has to do some execution. That's, I mean, it has to do some experimentation. That's been my whole thesis for the last however long we've been on stage together. So actually, if you look at indi any individual project or startup, you'll always find it on this continuum between these two things where the ratio of experimentation to execution changes over time and it becomes more and more and more and more execution oriented such that the kind of experimentation it does is actually best thought of as, as planting the seeds for a new whole new startup to start the cycle over again. So I have a series of these diagrams to try to illustrate that point uh, in the book. And again, drawing the connection to portfolio theory, since every manager today has been trained in finance, it's really easy to say, hey, if I told you I had a financial portfolio, my retirement for portfolio was exclusively invested only in the most conservative instrument available, such that I could greatly, with great accuracy, predict exactly what kind of what my returns are going to be, you know, period by period. Uh, am, I getting opt am I getting optimal returns? Everyone would be like that, and of course not. You can't seek alpha if you don't have a balance of, and you're like, okay, but your management portfolio, isn't the logic the same? Why is your management portfolio invested only in the most conservative instruments, namely high perceived ROI projects that follow a defined process you've done before? So if we're going to seek alpha as a corporation, we have to 
to, to diversify that portfolio into some more high risk, high reward type activities. And just like in strategic investing, we don't need to have a lot of our money in the high beta part because it's high beta. That's the whole point. So to say, look, I'm not saying you got to have like 50, 50 experimentation execution. Like, could we carve out 1%, 5%, 10% of a company's budget into these more, you know, more radical experiments, uh, we can get a much more attractive portfolio overall. I wanted to pull this quote out. <clears throat> it's uh, it's from the early chapters, but it's from the uh, the guy at the Toyota production oh, system, sure, yeah. the revered thing. And Tomiyama san, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He says. Uh, so Eric was at a meeting, and 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 the quote comes out. Uh, this is the missing. Ha so the Toyota production system, most people know, amazing. You know, continuous improvement, amazing. You know, Kaizen, like you know, revered worldwide. Uh, and 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 they started. Eric goes in there, and starts talking about lean startup, and this guy's quiet for a while. And then he yeah. he comes out and says, "This is the missing half of the Toyota production system. We have a system that is outstanding at producing what we specify with high quality, but we don't have a corresponding system for discovering what to produce in the first place." Yeah. Any comments on that? Oh, I was an amazing experience. Because look, you put lean in the title of your book. You're saying you put a target on your back because you're saying like I am correctly interpreting this body of work that you know goes back to the. Uh, the original Japanese senseis who, who came from Toyota and, and taught so many of us uh, those ideas. So when I first got the, the summons to go meet with Toyota, it was like getting called into the principal's office. Okay, like I was like, oh my God, they're going to say, I don't know anything. About what is this kid, California? I, I'd never set foot in an auto manufacturing plant in my life. So I don't know anything. I just read the book. So if the book was wrong, I'm definitely wrong. <laughs> like I, I did, I so I was really nervous about it, and they were very gracious and, and of all the people who could have been defensive about they don't need to listen to me, I'm not qualified to talk to them. Uh, they were amazing. And it and we eventually did a bunch of work together and it culminated in, in getting approval to do the project required the culmination with this very senior Toyota executive who's now at the center of a bunch of their cool uh, cool stuff that they're doing. You know, study Toyota, his name pops up all the time. Like anytime they're doing something interesting, you're like, who was behind that? And they read the end of the press release and it's like, oh, also on the board of that, you know, it's the Koretsu, so it's super complicated to follow and his name is always there. Um, he he made that comment to me, and it was like, I didn't. I mean, it was like amazing. It was just an amazing experience to to have someone who's like, you know, he is close to the Toyota family. He he has been at the company for a long time. He really knows what he's talking about. And so for him to say that there's this like, um, there are these two co-equal processes that have to integrate together. Nobody in that room could say like, what are you going to be like? No, no, sir, you're like, not. It's not correct. <laughs> like. He can speak with total authority on it, and then to see that just that one statement causes this cascade of activity to happen, because people hear what he said, and like, okay, if that's true, then we have to do this thing, we have to do these experiments, and and um, to see that uh, in the context of you know, Toyota is a very hierarchical, very traditionally Japanese company, so it's just, it was very interesting to to have that experience, and of course the connection to lean manufacturing made it extra special for me. So yeah, it was it was cool. Cool. So. Um why don't we just hop to uh, the, the other slide here, and I want to let Eric speak. So if, if we go back one, Kelly, briefly, um, the, so this is that sort of duality, right? The, the what to build and then how to build it efficiently. Yeah. And then if we flip to, I'm jumping like five steps in the book. Here. I know, right? It's like, <laughs> this only took me like 300 pages to get from here to there. <laughs> I'll do it for you in two so minutes. So two no, minutes. Fine. <laughs> I, the most common question I get from like press and stuff, like, so, so can you summarize the key ideas from the Lean Startup? That's like, if I could summarize them, I would have <laughs> I did. It's, like, it's right here. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the shortest document I could create to give you this information. What do you want from me? And my publisher was like, could you write flap copy or a summary? I'm like, no, I cannot. If I could write the summary, I would have to do the thing. <laughs> so, yeah, so with the caveat that this did take me 300 pages to try to explain. Uh, I do like this diagram. If, I don't know if can you read it. Is it large enough for you to read what it says? So you're, this, you're, this is like total spoiler alert here. So the whole book, like there's a series of build of diagrams. We make it increasingly, you know, incrementally more complicated to advance the argument. So this is, you're seeing the end first. Um, and each of the little dots on this diagram, uh, there's a legend that you know, shows what, what entrepreneurial activity is happening there. I called it the unified theory of entrepreneurship in the book, which is that today we manage a lot of different activities in different parts of the org chart that are actually the same. But because we don't have the right functional structure of the organization, we can't adopt common standards, we can't do cross-training, we can't get better at it as a discipline. And like I said before, like, you know, if it was finance, we'd be toast. 
So what I try to do is show that like entrepreneurial activity is happening throughout the organization right now in every organization already. So this is about harnessing and organizing it you know, under some kind of rational basis. So like, you know, for most companies, the people who buy startups are not related to the people that oversee internal startups. Like that's, that's corp dev and some kind of product development organization. And you guys have ever been in the room when the corp dev people hand over one of the acquisitions to the product people to now operate? Those, those meetings are really fun. I just paid $800 million for this thing that's gonna revolutionize you and everything that you do. Like, could you please realize those savings for me now? <laughs> anyway, anyway, my work here is done. Thanks for coming in. Uh, hi, startup, but please meet your new overlords. Like, and I once, I once had a very senior corp dev guy at one of the big public companies uh, say to me, I, he, had, he had just bought a friend of mine's company and they were doing the typical thing where they were doing executive exchanges now. Like they still kept the startup's office, they would close it shortly after, but they still pretended like they were gonna maintain the independent culture of the startup, that was the whole idea. And so they were having some executives rotate through and they said, would you come in and give a presentation on Lean Startup? You know, in the startup side, it's a friend of mine, I should do a few spam. Anyway, so one of the senior, senior executives who had approved the transaction was in the room, did this, and he's like, that's interesting, I liked your presentation, but I have a question for you. We buy startups all the time, and part of the thesis is always that we want to infuse the startup creativity and thinking into the parent company's DNA. And you would think by random chance, sometimes we would infect them, but sometimes they would infect us. You know, just, you could roll the dice. Each time wouldn't always work out every time, but how come it, it always is we infect them? And I was like, why are you asking me? Isn't it your job to buy these things? Like, so you're saying you buy them and kill them every time. <laughs> Why, like, it, and that's not a crisis? Like, your house is not on fire? This is not so you're just idly wondering about it, this workshop, this one time? Like, it was like, for me, it was just, again, one of these moments where you're like, I, what am I really supposed to say to you? Obviously, like, what I think business people are blind to sometimes is it's really difficult to get coordinated activity in a decentralized world. So if you ever see something happening the same across your whole organization, we shouldn't view that as, a, as like, random, that's magical. Like you can consistently destroy these startups in the exact same way every time. That's very impressive. A system is op like that requires work. Cause again, you, through random chance, right? If it was random, something random, like and I, you know, I see this in, in big companies all the time. Uh, projects are always, people are always multitasking. I don't know why corporate people are obsessed with multitasking. All the research by the way, that's ever been done on multitasking in the history of the universe shows that it's ineffective. Uh, and there's no productivity benefit to multitasking. It's a huge productivity task. Like, just don't ever do it under any circumstances if it can be avoided. And yet, every project team I ever meet is like got full of people who are like assigned 25% of the time here, 25% of the time there, 10% here, 5% here, like 1% there, right? And it's like, so, so it's really frustrating when we do internal startup transformations. Of course, we have to really teach the dedicated cross-functional team, the Amazon two pizza team concept, right? Like, to really push that as an important tool to have in your toolbox. And what I try to explain to people is like, but the fact that if I tell a manager in this company, give me, could you set, assign a project team to something, I know for sure it will be a, a part-time committee of people who are not, like I, I know certain things with great precision that are gonna happen every time. The fact that it happens every time is a miracle. <laughs> Think about the coordination that that requires, how hard it was to accomplish that. So people do that as bad news, like that's awfully depressing. We have this like creativity dampening field that we are like actively maintaining across our entire company. And like, well, that is depressing. But the good news is it's your own system. You own it and operate it. So maybe you could tune it to do something different. But the point is you can be consistent with your results because you have an incentivized system. So, so yeah, so like that, so Corp Dev, it's not even, it's, in a lot of companies, it's not even the same accounting bucket that the money comes out of. This is even more irritating to me. And so it goes all the way back to like gap financials and all kinds of stupidity. That if you buy a startup, it's like, you know, it's like you, that can be a capital expense. But if you fund a, an internal product development effort, that's just like, that's, that's ruining your EPS, right? So like, we, we treat these things as if they were totally different when they're actually exactly the same. And if you can't keep a potted plant alive, that you bought from the outside and transplant it into your soil, then you also can't plant a seed there and have it be successful. The problem is not the thing you bought and the, we, you know, we fire the product manager who did a bad job on the startup. We, we don't fire the CEO of the company we acquired because they're already cashed out. They're <laughs> walking off to the bank. But like, you know, we shut down that division when we're not happy with the results, but we never look at the soil. The, the commonality is we have bad soil that we're planting things into. So, 
So I think that when we start to see entrepreneurship as a, comp as a corporate discipline, when we manage it centrally, and I tried to show with this like dotted diagram, the entrepreneurial function has its tentacles in all these different places, we can then start to do some amazing things. Not just give people the right business card, which is very helpful for a sense of professional identity. We can create networking and professional development opportunities like that, like we have in every other function. But we can also start to cross train. I've done so many trainings now where we have people from legal and people from product and people from corp dev in the same room at the same time. And they have a lot to teach each other. And they actually can be really good coaches cross trained. And we know that because, hello, look at startups. Like cross functional collaboration and people like accidentally discovering a new talent and skill. It's like every fun profile you read about, every fun founder, like, oh, here's an unqualified person from the wrong function doing something amazing. So we know it happens, but we act as if it's Silicon Valley that made that possible. But like, it, they're just human beings. They don't have, they're not any smarter or different than anybody else. They were just given the opportunity to do this activity that corporations don't allow. And in fact, one of my most frustrating things for most companies I meet with is that if you ever seen this where you let somebody go, they leave the company, start a startup, get venture capital financing for it, and then you buy the company back. <laughs> Sometimes multiple times. I've met people who've sold the, sold the company back to the parent company more than once. <laughs> like, why did you let this person go? <laughs> it's a very expensive way to do HR. <laughs> and, and it's a massive un unearned subsidy to my friends on Sand Hill Road. Like they get 30, 40, 50% of these transactions for funding a person who already worked for you. <laughs> and like, where did they have the idea for the startup? Oh, they had it, I know for employment reasons, they had it the day after they quit. <laughs> but who believe, come on, like, what are we talking about? Those are not corp dev victories that we should celebrate. Those are HR failures that we should find humiliating. And all we have to do is recognize this as a, as a talent that we already have in our organization, and then really cool stuff can happen. Yeah, this picture was just, I think I've, we've actually tried to draw this picture, and we draw a lot of org charts, and where's the uh -huh, funding, yeah. and where's the innovation team, but um, it just it just helped. I wouldn't want to be on your sales team. That seems like really, <laughs> yeah, we, really it difficult. Take, take some ninja skills for sure. Um, Very impressive. But you have the, I, I just love that it's like the entrepreneurial activity has to go on in each business unit, in each function that's, that's cross business that's unit, right. and at the corporate layer like, like we just heard from Ed. So um, I, I don't think many companies are achieving this ideal uh, oh, quite yet not, today, not really. um, but there are pockets and promising yeah. pockets. Um, and, and look, and it, the challenge with a business book and being a business, like business people are not very theory oriented, you might have noticed. <laughs> It's not like, it's not, like you guys are, 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 the, are the extreme intellectual end of the business spectrum. Okay, so like the vast majority, and you know, because you've tried to talk to your colleagues about new, and they're like, I just want to do my thing, okay? I have like, I have a widget, I make this widget, we put it in a box, we sell it, we make money. Like that's what business is, it's not that complicated. Like you want to talk about disruption or whatever, but like on your own time, okay, buddy? <laughs> so, so it's hard sometimes. You, you want to be like, look, here's a theoretical framework for what it should look like. Some people will then say, well, unless I can find a company whose org chart looks exactly like this, then it's not real. And you're like, well, in the real world, like, first of all, most companies don't actually have an org chart. Okay, they, they don't. They make them sometimes for, like, the annual report or whatever. But, like, if you ask most people, like, where do you sit in the org chart? And all they know is I work for this person. And, like, you're like, but draw me the whole corporate org chart. Like, they... There, it'd, be, it'd be a gigantic rat, and it'd be impossible to follow. All the dotted lines and matrix manage. Like, so, so these are schematics to help us like, think in a different way about what the responsibility is. Every company that I've seen implement these ideas does it in their own way. Going all the way back to Toyota, it's not even called lean manufacturing at Toyota. It's called the Toyota production system. So every company has to make it their own. All right, now I think the clock is even more messed up, so we're, I think we'll wrap up here, but I got one more. <laughs> This, uh, this Bright Idea community is, uh, you know, there's a lot of what I would call innovation geeks, if you will, people that like the inside sure. baseball. So I've heard rumors that, that you were sort of close to Steve Blank, and then there was a bit of a falling out, and like, I don't know if there were differences on theory, or do you want to set the, but now is there a, a sure, comeuppance? I, 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 mean, I know, it's fine. That we, we have not had a falling I'm not aware of any falling out. Okay. Um, I guess it does take two to have a falling out. I, I have not had a falling out, so I don't know. <laughs> Uh, no, look, Steve was incredibly generous to me early in my career. He was an investor and board member at two of my early companies. And uh, I'll just tell you a funny story. Um, he was, uh, he, he had this theory called customer development, which is, you know, a really integral part of Lean Startup and, and uh, you know, very influential theory. 
and he was teaching it for the first time at the Haas Business School at Berkeley. And I had a startup in Palo Alto at the time. And uh, the, the main founder, I was just the CTO, the main founder of this company had just lost a bunch of Steve's money in his previous company. So this is the way it works in Silicon Valley. You like lose a lot of somebody's money, and you go back to them and say, hey, would you like to fund my next thing? <laughs> so he had the clips to be like, hi, no, I just lost you all this money, but we got this new, new thing that's like even better than the thing I just lost all this money on. And Steve, well, you know, in his, in his very um, charming way, said, sure, I'd be happy to lose money with you again, <laughs> but you have to audit my class at Berkeley. And we were like, oh, man, that's at Berkeley. We're in Palo Alto. It's a long drive. He's like, you guys are asking me for a lot of money, <laughs> right? Remember? And we're like, oh, yeah, right, right. Of course, whatever you want, we're happy to, happy to do it. So, so uh, once a week, my co-founder and I would make the long trek down to his classroom at Berkeley when he was just starting to teach us. And, I, and in retrospect, I'm like, did he just need more bodies in the room? <laughs> or like, well, I don't know. Like it was, it, was, it was considered such a controversial theory that like MBA students were having none of it. Okay, like this is a hostile classroom every time. Just being like, what do you know, old man? Every person is like, what do you know, young kid? Like Steve Blank's the, like, I, what do you know, old man? Like we will both get it. And he's from enterprise software. I'm consumer software. So I would sit in the room and people would be like, how is this ever going to work in consumer software? And like now I go to the talks where like, how is this ever going to work in enterprise software? I'm like, I was just in the room with the guy. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, and the funny part was, and this is like, this is something that always stayed with me. Um, and Steve, w one difference in style in the way that we teach related concepts, Steve is very much a step-by-step -step thinker. I mean, the book is called The Four Steps. And each step has 24 sub-steps, and the 24 sub-steps have fo four sub-steps each. And like, <laughs> if you count up the number of steps, especially if you ever, any of you actually the original draft, it's been edited now, so it's actually much better now, but like, it had way more steps before. Okay? <laughs> this thing had so many steps. I think I read that in PDF. It's actually, it's a, it's a wonderful book. I still, it's a reference for me. I go back to it all the time. So I mean this with, with nothing but love for Steve. A uh, lot of steps. And, <laughs> and my, so my co-founder and I would drive down to Berkeley arguing about whatever the problem of the day was for two hours where we sit in traffic or three hours sometimes to get down there, sit in his class, at, watch the MBA students complain about how everything he was saying was wrong. But we were sitting there taking copious notes like, oh my God, this is the solution to all our problems. We're so excited. And then we would go back home. We'd have three hours in the car going back home to argue about what Steve had just said. And we couldn't even agree. Five minutes after leaving, I would be like, okay, what he said is we gotta take this prototype that we're building right now to customers tomorrow. And my co-founder would be like, he didn't say that. <laughs> and I was like, were you in the same class that I was in? We, 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 just, we were just there. It was like my first lesson in how hard these concepts are to teach because you know, he, like, Steve would be like, okay, first step, do this, do this, do this, do this. And then, like, my co-founder would be like, well, what step are we on? And I'd be like, well, obviously, we're on step two, subsection three, part B. And he'd be like, we're not step two. We're on step three. I'm like, we're not step like we, we, We're totally in the wrong universe of where we are. So uh, it was really, like, that, those were really fun days. And, um, and Steve was incredibly kind to me uh, to, you know, to, to mentor me in that way, to come onto our board of that company and, and be really, uh, really involved. And I, you know, I used to see him all the time. Now we're both, it's rare for us to be in the same city at the same time. So, yeah. Great. Well, uh, we're going to have Eric out in the atrium uh, for about half an hour signing books. Grab your book. Uh, you'll be first in the world to have it. And uh, wish you a ton of success uh, with the book and oh, with thank the you tour. Very much. And uh, come back and see us again soon. Anytime. Love that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>